Let's talk, let's talk the law today, brethren. As we talked last time in part one, we, we started by going through the the, the situation that we're seeing in the world increasing, and as we know, as prophecy says, this this uh, mystery of lawlessness that was around in, in Paul's day and and was would be increasing, and especially in the end time, this man of, of lawlessness, this man of sin, would be uh, filled with lawlessness and all kinds of deceptions and delusions uh, that we 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 uh, mentioned uh, will be present down the stretch. And, and in, in doing that, we were trying to set the stage for the importance, as, as we all know, brethren, but the importance of lawfulness to be able to recognize what lawlessness is down the stretch as uh, these things uh, began, begin to uh, continue to worsen uh, nearing the, the time of Christ. And, and, and in that, we, we emphasize our ability to discern, our ability to, to make decisions, uh, in part, will be based upon our understanding of the law, understanding of the, of the, of the law itself, the, the essence of the law, the, the details of the law, and the... Uh, the, the spirit of the law, the intent of the law as we go forward. So uh, we asked uh, as well uh, for those of you that were uh, able to do so to read the assignments that we gave. So I don't know if, if, uh, if you were able to do so, but I, but I hope you found it an interesting study. I always find it fascinating to go back into God's law, and I strive to do that regularly, but not as often as I should, going into the law and seeing the details with which God goes through and outlines his law for Israel. And in doing so, reflecting upon, okay, here he is working with that nation there, but always keeping in our minds that, uh, as Paul said in Romans 7, the law is spiritual. The, all the details that are contained in the Pentateuch, the Torah, uh, and uh, as well as the specific statutes, judgments, and, and ordinances, those are spiritual. The law is, is spiritual. And, and in that, here we are as God's people to, to recognize all of these details and to strive to pull out of that uh, as we read that, the spiritual intent of all of those, all of those laws and statutes and judgments. So here we are uh, today uh, covering part two, and I, uh, True Confessions by Burnett, there are going to be three parts. I, it, I, I, please forgive me, but uh, I can tell you uh, emphatically there will be uh, three parts unless I've died and I'm not able to speak uh, the next time that I'm assigned. So let's go to Deuteronomy 5. Now, now last time we, we covered, we, we wanted to emphasize in, in looking at the law how you cannot pull out the law from God's love. You cannot extricate one from the, the other. We know God, we, we love God. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Uh, God is love. These are God's commandments. God wants us to love his law. He wants us to love him, the two great commandments. Love God with all our heart, mind, and strength. Love our neighbor as ourselves. The law and love are intricately, intricately woven together. This being, or these two beings, uh, and Jesus Christ, who, who gave the law, uh, is, is the God of love. And it is all about his love, and he wants us to love him back, and we love him back by understanding God's law and, and fearing him, loving him, and obeying him. So, so in that, we, we brought out the point in Deuteronomy 5, even in the second commandment of the thou shalt nots and, uh, and no gra graven images, all of these, these uh, statements that he makes, you shall not... Uh, kill you, shall not commit adultery, shall not, shall not steal, not covet, not bear false witness. We saw in Deuteronomy 5, I'll just quote it again, even nestled in the Ten Commandments itself, at, in looking at the second commandment, he makes the statement, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Uh, even in, in the, the, the Ten Commandments, within that, that statement is there of loving God. 
So he then, let's jump now ahead to Deuteronomy 5, verse 29, a memory scripture. As, as he's given them all, all of these things, all of these truths, he, he makes this statement, uh, and, and it's, it's a painful statement to make as he talks to <clears throat> ancient Israel. Verse 29, the, and these are the folks that uh, haven't died off. These are the folks that are getting ready to go into the land of Canaan. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. So go and say to them, uh, return to your tents, but as for you, stand here by me, he says to Moses, and I will speak to you all the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments, which you shall teach them, that they may observe them in the land which I am giving them to possess. Therefore, you shall be careful to do as the eternal your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. When has that changed? Is that, is that the case now? Is it the case now for God's people, the Israel of God? Uh, made up of all kinds of different ethnicities that are uh, bound together by being sired by God through the Holy Spirit, that we are his through the sacrifice of Christ. Uh, it, has that changed? It has not changed. Verse 33, you shall walk in all the ways which the eternal your God has commanded you that you may live and that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. So then we, we come into Deuteronomy 6, where he gets into the, the, uh, the Shema, the hero Israel, the Lord our God is one, and, and the loving the eternal with all our uh, heart, mind, and soul, and, and how to teach, and to teach our children. But prior to that, notice what he says here in verse 1. Now, this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the eternal your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess. Verse 2, that you may fear the eternal your God, fear him to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, you and your son, your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, O hero Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you. Again, all of these things come back to God saying, I, I want to bless you. I, I want to give you all uh, of the abundance uh, that uh, is, will be afforded to you. But be careful to observe it. Verse, uh, verse 3, continuing, And then it shall multiply greatly as the eternal God of your fathers has promised you in, in going into this land flowing with milk and honey. So hear, O Israel, the eternal, uh, our God, the Lord is one. God alone, he is God, as the margin renders. So love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. There is this, it, one of the things that fascinates me with, with God's law, with looking at the law, is, is as we've said earlier, seeing the, the spiritual nature of God's law throughout the law. So many out there in Christianity see it as this list of do's and don'ts and these things, and if this happens, you do this to this person and, and this, and they're not able to, uh, because their minds have not been open to, to understand that, is see the spiritual intent of the law uh, th that is complete, that completely uh, has its tentacles in every aspect of the law. In every time I go back and look at the law, I am amazed at how the spiritual intent is there uh, throughout. Of course, Dr. Levy uh, has talked about uh, that as well as we approach uh, looking at, at these truths of God. So I, I would ask us, as we just read verse 6 of chapter 6, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Are the laws of God, are the statutes, the judgments, are they in our hearts? Are they kept in our hearts? The degree to which the laws of God that, that show us right from wrong, that show us what love is, that show us uh, how to love God and how to love uh, our neighbor, 
Those must be in our hearts if we are to be able to discern right from wrong, if we are to be able to detect as we see lawlessness continuing to increase its, uh, its influence on every aspect of, of mankind's uh, rules and, and guidelines that we see moving forward in the end time. It, all of that must be in place for us to see that. Let's, uh, let's go to Proverbs 19. The comfort and peace of mind that we gain from seeing and recognizing the truths of God's law for life's applications uh, and then going forward and applying that is, is hard to, to put a value on. I, I know I'm not saying anything to, to anybody here that they hadn't, hadn't known before, but I, I think about that sometimes. The, despite the challenges that we face, the the, uh, be it car problems, as Mr. as Mr. Vaughn talked about, or whatever, but the comfort and peace of mind that we experience as God's people is, is, is unparalleled because we see God's law and, and the applications of that law uh, to give us that peace of mind, to give us a, a direction and a path uh, to follow. Proverbs 19 uh, talks about that from the the opposite view of what happens otherwise. He says this, uh, Proverbs 19, verse 1, Better is the poor, the, the person who is not loaded with dough, uh, who has enough just to get by, the, the poor uh, who walks in his integrity, who, who walks in the wisdom of God's way and in, in, in the truths of God and in living an, an open and truthful life uh, before God, uh, with, with God's values placed at the front of that individual's life. Better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one who is perverse in his lips and is a fool. And it's also, it is not good for a soul to be without knowledge. He sins who hastens with his feet. He sins, he transgresses the law who hastens with his, with his feet. Brethren, we've got to have the knowledge of God. We've got to continually be pouring over the laws of God and, and understanding the, the, the meaning of that, the intent of that, if we are going to be able to, to walk down that path or to see right from wrong. Look at verse 3. Verse 3, the foolishness of a man, the, the rebelliousness of a man, the way that a man or, or a woman, for that matter, can can begin to reason through this or reason through this way or that way to, to go down a direction that he or she knows is not right but, but wants to do it. You know, this, this, this foolishness of a man twists his way and the path then becomes, uh, it becomes the, the kind of thing where I don't know where, where necessarily I'm going. It, it's all twisted. I, I, if, I, if I take a step here, well, I've said this and this and this, and I've not really been truthful in this area, so I've got to dance this way, and it, it just gets to where, where am I going? Where am I going, and how am I navigating life? And his heart frets against the Lord. The opposite of that would be the wisdom, the godly wisdom of a man twists, uh, twists not his way, but gives him clarity of, of direction. And his heart is at peace. He is, uh, has that peace of mind uh, along with God. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 7 today. We're going to talk as we get into the, the, the subject of the law a, a little bit more. We're going to talk about the spiritual nature or the spiritual intent, the, the spiritual principles that just jump out at, at us as we, as we read God's law. I think Deuteronomy 7 uh, through, uh, through parts of Deuteronomy 8 uh, really articulate that. One of the things that has, has helped me as I read God's word is I, as I, in these areas, is first, first I look at, okay, this is physical Israel. He's talking with physical Israel. He's working with them. They are a nation. They're a physical nation. They've got to have laws. They've got to have rules. They've got to have punishment and judgment because they have control over that nation. There is a difference between that and the Israel of God. 
which is the church, the, the body of Christ. Uh, we, as well, have uh, rules and laws and, and, and guidelines which we follow. The way in which those are administered is different from, from the other, and we'll get into that in a second. But I always strive to read this and, and, and jump into what, what's go, what was going on then and why would they need to set it up that way with, with, the, with the nation uh, that, that was needing to be governed and, and, and guided and, and directed in a right path so that as a nation they could be a model nation to, to mankind. But take that and then move to, okay, Burnett's in the Israel of God. I'm in, I'm in the body of Christ that on a spiritual level uh, is, is trying to go this direction to be more and more like Christ, our high priest. So always looking at all the spiritual implications. So let, let's think of the spiritual implications for spiritual Israel as we read this passage. Deuteronomy 7, verse 11. Deuteronomy 7, verse 11. He says, therefore, you shall keep the commandment, keep the statutes, keep the judgments which I command you today to observe them. Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that the eternal your God will keep with you the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers. Same, uh, same with us today. He will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land, your grain, your new wine, your oil, the increase of your cattle, the offspring of your flock, and the land which he swore uh, to your fathers to give you. So we think of the physical implications that God's doing as he's working with uh, this nation to use them as a model nation, and, and, and other nations would see the abundance of that. We look spiritually at the incredible spiritual blessings that God gives us as a result of that. The way that he, he changes our lives and, and takes us in a direction that is, uh, that's modeled after the life of Christ. And in all of the, you, know, you look at verse 15, take away from you all the sickness. We, we see the, the analogy to Isaiah, the, the entire book of Isaiah, as talks about the Savior, Jesus Christ, who heals us, who has healed us spiritually uh, of, our, of, our, of our sickness, of our incurable death, of, of being headed towards eternal death. Christ, through his sacrifice, has healed us. Christ healed the sick as a, as a way of helping us understand the, the spiritual healing that, uh, that he has done uh, for us and ultimately will do for all of mankind as, as they're called and they yield. Notice what he says here. Uh, let's drop down to verse 16. Think of this on the spiritual level. Also, you shall destroy all the peoples whom the Lord your God delivers over to you. Your eye shall have no pity on them, nor shall you serve their gods, for they will be a snare to you. We see our battle is spiritual. We, we battle sin. We battle wicked spirits in high places. We see that. We recognize that. That is the enemy. We should not fear them. We should not have pity on evil. And he says here in verse 17, that if you should say in your heart, well, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? How can I overcome the things that, with which I battle, the, the, the challenges and, the, and, and the, uh, the, the great areas of weakness that any of us could have in any area of life? How can I do that? He's saying, recognize this, this is God here that you're dealing with. This is, this is the eternal God who can do miracles in our lives. Do not be afraid of them, verse, verse 18, but you shall remember well that the eternal, what, what the eternal your God did to Pharaoh and all Egypt. He took them away, and it was gone. The great trials which your eyes saw, the signs and the wonders, the mighty hand and the outstretched arm by which the eternal your God brought you out, as God has reached in and brought us out of this world, so shall the, the eternal your God do to all peoples of whom you are afraid. Verse 20, moreover, the eternal your God will send the hornet among them until those who are left who hide themselves from you are destroyed. Have you ever been in a situation where uh, a, a person is behaving against you in an evil manner? 
and you're, you're, you're striving to do what's right, you're trying, striving to live what's right. We've tried at every little angle to try to work with that person, to, to try to come to peace of mind, and then you realize this person is bent on doing evil to me. This, and, and I can't do anything about it. I am stuck. All I can do is continue to try to walk in God's ways, do things right, pray for God's intervention, and, uh, and bear with it. And, and then here come the hornets. And all of a sudden, that person's not in the picture. That person that was, was doing whatever he or she was doing to us in, in acting evil against us is gone, is out of the picture. Have you, any of you seen the, the hornets at work in, in your life when, when those things have happened? They happen. God, God does that for us. He also allows us to go through trials and stresses to strengthen us, to test us. But God, God can provide the hornets. I, I've seen the hornets come, not literally, but, but they were some pretty nasty hornets because they got rid of, they got rid of the situation in God's time. You shall not be terrified of them, Notice this, verse 21. For the eternal your God, the great and awesome God, is among you. And the eternal your God will drive out those nations before you. And he'll do it little by little. You'll be unable to destroy them at once, lest the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. You, you go into a, a land and you wipe out everything. Well, then the, the beasts of the field come in. Well, I, I think you know, spiritually it's, it, it's interesting that in our lives God doesn't wipe out all of, of our challenges. God doesn't wipe out all the things with which we're struggling in our lives all at once. I got baptized, and I got the Spirit of God, and I got no problems. I got no issues. I got no tests. It's all great. It, it just isn't that way, is it? Uh, but, but as we yield to God, and as we love Him, and demonstrate that love through a deep love of his, of his teachings and his laws and yielding ourselves completely to these laws, he drives them out. He drives them out uh, little by little. And as we take stock and reflect on that, we see where we were and we see where we are uh, to God's glory. Verse 24, he'll deliver their kings into your hand. You'll destroy their name from under heaven. No one shall be able to stand against you until you have destroyed them. You shall burn the carved images of their gods with fire. Don't covet the silver or gold that's on them, nor take it for yourselves, lest you be snared by it. For it's an abomination to the eternal your God. Nor shall you bring an abomination into your house, lest you be doomed to destruction like it. You shall utterly detest it and utterly abhor it, for it is an accursed thing. When God says something... In the Old Testament, this is an abomination. This is an evil abomination. This is an accursed thing. It, that abomination doesn't go away just because the New Covenant came around. Those abominations that were there in the Old Testament that he talks about, this is an abomination. This is an abominable thing. It's abominable. Don't eat this. It doesn't all of a sudden become wonderful and we can eat it, as he talks about food laws. Uh, because this act of sexual immorality is abominable in the Old Testament. It doesn't mean that it is uh, now okay in the New Testament. Abominations uh, are always abominations. The penalty for, those abom for, for committing those abominations and how they were administered in the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant uh, are different, but we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that in a second. Look at verse 1 of chapter 8. So he says again, every commandment which I command you today, be careful to observe it, that you may live and multiply to go into the land. I love this verse in verse 2 here. And you shall remember that the eternal your God led you all, uh, all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. As we look on our lives, and some have been in, in this way for 40 or more years, others of us less, but regardless, we look at our path, uh, our, our path and our, our calling and, and our walk, and we, we look back and we, we realize, yes, God, God has been with us. He's helped us. He's led us. Sometimes we turn from him, and he in his mercy, and sometimes in his righteous uh, anger uh, has 
has dealt with us accordingly, but always in his love, we, we come back realizing, yeah, God, God is, is leading me in this way, even, even in this time of wilderness uh, that some of us can fall into. He led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you. God humbles us. We humble ourselves, hopefully, and he humbles us, and, and he tests us. And it's a good thing for God to test us because he wants to know what is in our hearts and whether we will keep his commandments. So he humbled you. He allowed you to hunger sometimes. He fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did his fathers know, that he might make you know what? That he might make you know, again, the essence, the, the, the spiritual nature of the law. The, the spiritual nature that, that Jesus Christ quoted as Satan tried to uh, tempt him in uh, commanding the bread to be, to be stone. That Christ, who is the word, who gave the law to Moses and, and to Israel, Christ was quoting of what he had said uh, as, he, as he battled Satan. So he could see clearly and discern clearly the direction of, of and the decision and discern where Satan was attacking him because he was so filled with the law of God. The law of God which says and which has always been spiritual, man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. The Old Testament, the law is beautiful. It's, it's beautiful words of God that are filled with the spiritual essence of his law as well as the details of his law, lawfulness. So how are we doing? How are we doing? Uh, as we go forward, uh, we're, I want to in the next, uh, this message in the next, I want to uh, explore just two examples from the law. Now, by the way, for those of you that have been reading that and you've, you've read other things, little little interesting statements within the law that you thought, man, I'd like to talk about that. Hunt me down. Hunt down Dr. Levy if it's a really tough question. Uh, but but, but talk, talk to us about that. I, I think it's fascinating seeing the, the spiritual implications of God's law as, as it's rendered and, and how that would have applied then to, to this nation uh, of Israel. But, but even more importantly for us today, as these were written as examples for us now, how that applies to us. We're going to tie, as we look at two examples, we're going to tie these passages within God's law to other passages of Scripture that, that build upon that. Uh, you know, the law, the prophets, and the writings that we see in the Old Testament, and then the statements, the teachings of Christ, the teachings of Christ through uh, the various uh, apostles and, and servants of God who who wrote uh, God's word, God's breathed word to us, which is the fullness of scripture now. Uh, all scripture is given by in inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for uh, uh, correction, and, and for uh, correction, reproof, and instruction in righteousness, fully equipping us for every good work, fully equipping us to be able to discern right from wrong. So I guess our, our title for the, the rest of the series uh, could be best rendered, Lawfulness in the Midst of Lawlessness. Lawfulness, an essential component to discernment and decision-making in the end time. So let's go to Deuteronomy 13 as we look at one of these principles. And as you're turning there, uh, Dr. Levy has covered uh, some of these points, if not all of these points uh, before. I don't know that I'll uh, render them as, as effectively as he did, but I would like to just say at the forefront, as we read the law, as we read the, the Pentateuch, as we see especially the statutes and the judgments, the commandments, the ordinances, all of these that... that that come out uh, in God's word, it's important for us to keep several things in mind. Let's, let's talk about those before we start reading in Deuteronomy 13. One is we need to always recognize, as we've just hinted on before, uh, the, the, that there is a difference in the administration or the implementation uh, for violating these laws, these statutes and judgments. Uh, difference in what, what was done to the physical nation of Israel versus the Israel of God. 
the laws are the same, the, the principles are the same, they have the same value, but uh, so, you know, if, if a person commits adultery, what was to be done? Death. I've, I've not particularly uh, killed anybody lately. Uh, you know what I'm saying. It, it, was a different, it was a different situation. They, for this, God said, in, in this nation, in having just penalties and, and recognizing that this will, will, will cause issues for the in, entire, uh, in, entire country, if, if we, we allow this, we do this, it was death. Now, now we understand uh, adultery, unrepented of, is eternal death. We, we, we get that. But in terms of, of that situation, there, the, the, there, the penalties were different. The penalty for that was death. Uh, in, 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 with the Israel of God, the penalty is there are, there are still consequences. There are consequences that, that the, the, the church enacts for individuals that would sin in that way, it, just as there are for a variety of different things. There are consequences, but they are different. And, and we're also keeping in mind repentance, forgiveness, restoration to the fellowship, all, all of those, those kinds of things. But the administration or the implementation for violating these laws, statutes, or judgments uh, may differ. Secondly, we see certain symbols uh, changing with the new covenant. The principles are still the same. The principles are still exactly the same, but, but the, the symbols change as, as clearly stipulated in the new covenant. We, we know those, but let's just review a few of them. One is sacrifices. We know that the sacrifices were only symbolic. They, can't, they cannot do what Jesus Christ did. They can't remove uh, sin. They can't uh, cleanse the sin or totally expiate the sin. Only the blood of Christ, uh, this God being who came and gave his perfect life for that, he had the power to do that for us. Uh, it was a type. Uh, so we, we no longer do sacrifices uh, because of, of what it states in scriptures, especially Hebrews. Circumcision. Circumcision, as is brought out by Paul and, and others, circumcision is of the heart. If, you, if a person is physically circumcised, uh, that does not mean they are part of the Israel of God. The Israel of God is, is made up of individuals who are circumcised of the heart. The foreskin of their heart has been removed so that they can walk in and understand the spiritual intent of the law. That is that is a, a critical symbolic change, an understanding that the, the, the circumcision was only a type to help us understand this, the greater concept. Another uh, big area is, is in the, 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 uh, the understanding of going from the Levitical priesthood to the priesthood of Melchizedek. As, as is talked about in Hebrews. The, the Levitical priesthood had the responsibility, of, which we'll look at here in just a second, of, of teaching God's law. You had the, 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 uh, the of course, you had the, the priesthood within the Levitical, uh, the tribe of Levi that, that had certain roles, the Levites which had certain roles, but they were responsible for the teaching of God's way of life. Uh, they had a high priest who did his role inside the Holy of Holies. Jesus Christ, after the priesthood of Melchizedek, with, with no beginning of, of days, serves as high priest. He predated, he predated uh, Levi. He was, he was there. He has no beginning of days. No uh, father, mother, as, as, as Hebrews tells us. He was there as, as Abraham gave tithes to him there in Salem. Jesus Christ's priesthood of Melchizedek is in is in force today it is there they are the he as the high priest has his body the church with whom he works and there are responsibilities within the church uh, and and ministers have a responsibility the brethren have a responsibility all the different leadership responsibilities but it's under the priesthood of melchizedek the true high priest that intervenes for us and and another aspect i guess a uh, uh, a last uh, aspect is the recognition, and not that this was not in effect before in the, in the Old Testament, but it's the recognition for us as God's people that we must worship in spirit and in truth. 
we cannot just have these words uh, and, and these, these specific laws if we do not understand the spiritual intent of the laws, uh, of, of how it is to be written on our hearts because it is spiritual and to see that it demonstrates, as we've talked before, uh, love towards God and, and God's love toward, toward us and, and, God, and our love towards one another. We must keep the law and also keep the spiritual intent of the law. Or, or we could say we must, in keep, we must keep thus the law which is spiritual. We must always keep the law with its spiritual intent as well as, as, as keeping the law uh, in detail. So let's go to Deuteronomy 13. So what we're going to look at today as we uh, go forward here is uh, one, one example. I think that's probably what uh, we'll get through today. At least that's how far we got in Sherman. So I, I had trouble setting up this, this first uh, statement of, of what we want to address. Here's what, I, here's what I want to look at of how God's law helps us discern and navigate. So what, what we're going to discuss is what we see going on in today's society. We think of the, the sages, the, those who are looked upon in society today as, as people of wisdom to whom we should look. They, they say this, they say that they have uh, their thoughts about the state of the nation, the direction the nation needs to go. What are the problems of the nation? What are the problems that we see in religion, in church, in, in, in how we should... Uh, nationwide around the world things that need to be done to turn things in the right direction we we have those kinds of individuals we have individuals that move into the religious realm of that that consider themselves as as teachers of 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 the way of life that is that one should be living uh, sometimes people move even into the realm of of being a uh, prophets or prognosticators. I think sometimes of some of the folks on talk radio that have a certain bent, you know, they'll say, I said, I said that if our country did this and this and this, this many years ago, this was going to happen. And look, it's come to pass. Uh, if we don't do this and take care of this business here, this is how this will play out. And look, it has. Uh, I'm, so I'm lumping all of that into one massive blob, okay? So so here we are, God's people, who are humbled by the fact that God has called us, that he has pulled us out of Egypt to, to love him and learn to fear him and revere him, reverence him in every way and be careful to observe his ways. How does he, or where is it in God's law that he, gives a, that he can give us the ability to navigate these kinds of things, these, these teachings that are out there? This person wrote a really good book, really good insight on this, and this person has this insight, and, and this and that. I, I found that, that uh, there are d tremendous uh, amounts of books that can help with little insights here and there, but God's people, all of us need to be able to navigate that and, and see, well, what can I take from this that would be of value, but also be on guard of, of not making this wise person my hero. He's the person, he's just got, he's got it down on this, 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 and this. Wow, he sees it like it is. Uh, and then all of a sudden we're off to the races down uh, this person's thoughts, uh, down the path of this person's thoughts, and not staying grounded with what his law says. Get it, got it good? So that, that's, that's what uh, we want to talk about. Deuteronomy 13, verse, verse 1, it's, it's interesting how God lays this all out. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, wow, you know, he said this is going to happen, and, and even in a, in, from, a, from a biblical sense or, or a prophetic sense, he said this is going to happen, and boom, it happens. Wow, that person must be, uh, that person must be of the truth. That person has, has this knowledge. I, I need to hear what this person says. Uh, and then saying, let us go after other gods. He says to you, Israel, which, gods which you have not known, and, and let, us, let us serve them. Now, when we, when we see, let us go after other gods, uh, which we have not known, let us serve them. We know the God of this world. We know the ones, that, we know that it says his, 
his ministers are, are, appear just as Satan does, as, as angels of light. So he's, we're, we're to be very, very careful here. Verse 3, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the eternal your God is testing you. He's testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. There, there again is that, that spiritual intent. God tests us. He wants to know the degree to which we're going to be influenced by these, these sages, these, these folks of, 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 quote, wisdom, as they have insights here or there to where we can get pulled or, or turned in, in this way. He says, no, in verse 4, you shall walk after the eternal, your God, and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. This is where our noses need to be. We need to be grounded in this word. And I'm, and I'm not saying we should never read this book or this book or this thought or this, this thought to, to understand uh, history to understand some of the things that are going on in the world. But boy, brethren, we've got to be grounded in this. Uh, this, is, this is that love. This is that, that spiritual intent of, of his law here. Verse 5, but that prophet or, or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. So that's what we should do in the church. We've got somebody that started doing this. He gets off the track. And he do, we just need to go out and put him, string him up, put him to death. Uh, you know, so obviously that, that's, that's the difference here. He's talking, he's talking about uh, how as a nation that comes in as a poison and infects the entire nation. So he says you've got to rid yourself of that. Spiritual Israel, Israel of God, we put that person out. We, we reject those, those claims of someone who is saying something that may come to pass, but, it is, but the other things that this person is teaching is not of God, so we reject that. We get that far away from us. Uh, the, the Israel of God application, where, the, again, the consequences are different. The principle is still the same. Even he says, uh, so he says, uh, ver, so continuing in verse 5, because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the eternal your God. Some may do that intentionally. Some uh, often could be very unintentional. They're convicted that what they're, they're thinking and what their approach is is correct. But to turn you away from the eternal your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage, to entice you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. That's that we realize where the battle lies. The battle lies with wicked spirits in high places. Um, Satan uses others to entice us away from the, the way in which the Lord God commanded us to walk. Put evil away from your midst. Even brother or sister, as it says in verse 6 that, that comes in there. Put that away. Don't consent to him. Don't listen to him. Verse 8, don't spare him. Don't conceal him. If there is a situation where a person is, is teaching false, falsehoods and, and actively doing that and causing dissension, don't, don't, don't hide this person or conceal him from others. But in verse 9, uh, you shall surely kill him. That was in order to, to keep that nation a, a clean nation before God. Uh, Verse 15 talks about even if, if it happens with a city, go in and, and diligently search out a matter. And if the whole city is in that situation, deal with that. Uh, verse 18, I'll, I'll end it by saying this with, that, with this thought here. Because you have listened to the voice of the Lord your God to keep all his commandments, which I command you today to do what is right in the eyes of the eternal your God. So he gave directions on how to approach those kinds of matters with folks that were not teaching the right way. Look at Deuteronomy 18, again in the law. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, verse, verse 9, we see uh, more and more of this uh, in, uh, coming more out in the forefront even of our nation today, these kinds of things that are, that are just outright abominations in terms of uh, 
prophecies, instructions, insights, and how they get insights and in, in what things are going to pass, come to pass. Verse 9, when you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you, you, sh- given you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, uh, as is, was part of that worship system of, uh, I think, Tophet and uh, uh, some of the uh, other other religions there of the day, or one who practices witchcraft, a soothsayer, one who interprets omens, a sorcerer, conjures spells, a medium, a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. All who do these things are are an abomination to the eternal. And because of these abominations, the eternal your God drives them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God, for the nations which you will dispossess listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. Deuteronomy 33. Let's look there. Deuteronomy 33, verse 8. Deuteronomy 33, verse 8. Here, uh, Moses is is near the end of his days, and he's... uh, issuing a blessing uh, to the the various tribes and he speaks to Levi he worked through Levi Levi w- was to do the tribe of Levi w- were, were to be the was to be the the group of individuals who taught God's way and were valiant for the laws of God uh, and and set the example in that in in the teaching of it and in the administ- administration of it. Notice what he says here. Uh, he talks about the Urim and the Thummim uh, being with your Holy One. Drop down to uh, the, the middle of verse 9 of, of the role of Levi. For they have observed your word, they have kept your covenant, they shall teach Jacob your judgments, and Israel your law. Inter- interchangeable words there. Jacob, Israel, both are the same. Uh, they shall teach Jacob, your judgments, and Israel, your law. They shall put incense before you and a a whole burnt sacrifice uh, on your altar. Bless his substance, Lord, and accept the work of his hands. Strike the loins of those who are against him and of those who hate him, that they rise not again. We see evidence of uh, those from the tribe of Levi being valiant for God's way of life and, and in that causing uh, God to turn from his wrath uh, at times. One such example is found in Numbers 25. Let's go there. Numbers 25. Again, we're, we're dealing with this whole subject of how to navigate through the truths and the errors uh, that are out there, uh, folks that are that are going to come and and have miracles, as we we know that that son of perdition, that false prophet, will will be able to do great powers given him, but but yet also be filled with lawlessness, as we talked about last time. Numbers twenty five. This, this is the story when when you've got uh, when you've got Balaam that's enticed Israel to sin. They're they're involved in this, you know, immoral religious practices. They're involved in uh, adultery, adulterous, idolatrous practice. And uh, one of the priesthood, one of the sons of the priesthood, uh, Phineas, sees this situation and sees what's going on and the abomination of that. So we think about this from the standpoint of the love of God, the love of his ways, and, and seeing the evil that it is and dealing with a physical nation. We're spiritual Israel, but he was dealing with the physical nation and he acted immediately on that. And what did God give him as a result? I think it's interesting the terminology that he uses here of, of what that action was, the decisive action, uh, and the very uh, graphic action that he took, but what God grants him as a result. And this gives us, uh, a, gives us clarity on how we should look at sin when we see that uh, near us or around us. Uh, Deuteronomy uh, sorry, Numbers 25. Numbers 25, let's break, break into that as, as Phineas became aware of the situation. Uh, verse 7, now when Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose from among the congregation. He took a javelin in his hand and he went after the man of, of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through. Uh, the man of Israel and the woman threw her body so the plague was stopped 
among the children of Israel. Through this plague of Israel being caught up in this, this horrible, idolatrous, adulterous, uh, sexual immoral uh, situation, those who died in the plague were 24,000. So the Eternal spoke to Moses in verse uh, 11 saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the children of Israel. Why? Because he was zealous with my zeal among them so that I did not consume the children of Israel in, in my zeal. Verse 12, therefore say, behold, I give to him, I give to Phinehas, my covenant of peace. God grants us peace to the degree to which we act very decisively against evil in our, in our spiritual lives individually and even as, as a church, as, as we deal with situations, I mean, obviously we are to be merciful and, and help individuals that are battling uh, sins as, as we are human as well uh, as the ministry. We have a responsibility before God to walk appropriately, and we definitely want God to be merciful to us, so we, we strive to be merciful in, in working with one another. We know that God is an incredibly merciful God. He is the great merciful God, but at the same time, there, there is clarity in what is white what is white what is white and what is wrong uh, what is right and what is wrong there's clarity in that and god expects us to act decisively on that to not uh, to not toy around with that and and through that he gives the covenant of peace <sighs> how do i handle this there's this 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 i don't know should i work it this way or work it this way here here's what needs to be done uh, do it. Act decisively. And God grants uh, the covenant of peace. Look at uh, how that plays out in, in Malachi 2. Malachi 2 as one of the last, uh, well, the last prophecy, at least time-wise, of, of the Old Testament uh, that Malachi gives in talking about the role of the Levites in and the degree to which God places that responsibility on them to, to provide that guidance, uh, uh, I would submit, as, as he does for uh, under, under the high priest Jesus Christ and what, what God expects of, of the ministry and what God expects of all of us as we are leaders in our families. Uh, Malachi 2, we won't read through the, the entire portion here of Malachi 2, but let's pick it up in... Uh, Verse 4, then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the eternal of hosts. Uh, Malachi 2, verse 5, my covenant was with him, one of life and peace. And I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me and was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth. And injustice, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and turned many, as a result, away from iniquity. And people should seek the law from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the eternal of hosts. But he says, but you have departed from the way and you've caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi. So I've made you contemptible and base before all the people because you have not kept my ways but have shown partiality in the law. So critical for us uh, to understand the law as all of God's people, very critical for us as well, uh, those that are in the ministry to understand that, very critical for us as, as parents to understand the law and to teach this law, this law that is love and 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 not show partiality in the law, but see it for as it is, walk in that, follow that, lean on that, rest on that, and God gives us peace. Despite all the challenges that we face, he gives us that peace. Another passage, 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3. As we look at a, a new covenant application to this 
understanding and grasping how to deal with situations, interacting with, with others who uh, are not walking in God's ways, who are striving to push things at us that are, are not of God, that are not of his teachings, and, and how we should reject that. As we, as we said, we don't uh, put them to death, but we, we reject that. We, we recognize that, that spiritual uh, evil that is there and, and move ourselves, call it for what it is, and, and move ourselves away from it uh, so that we can still see clearly. As we stay in that, it begins to cloud our ability to discern and make proper decisions. Peter, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Paul goes through all of 1 Timothy, emphasizing to Timothy, do this, do that, stay grounded in the word, Uh, lean heavily upon God's word as as you instruct others, recognize the role of of, of the church uh, and how to instruct them according to the word. We see more of that uh, even, you know, we see it in like verses 12 through 15 or 16 of, of 1 Timothy 4, just Ground, stay grounded in the truth, stay grounded in God's ways and in his teachings and, and recognize that and go forward accordingly. So he makes this summation statement after, after he sent this letter to, to Timothy at the very end. Look at verse 3 of chapter 6, 1 Timothy 3 verse 6. So he says, if anyone teaches otherwise than the things that I, I, we've been talking about here that I've sent in this letter, Timothy, uh, and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine, you know, the, the, the teaching which accords with godliness. How do we recognize doctrine that accords with godliness? We, we understand godliness, godliness versus ungodliness. We understand right versus wrong, sin versus walking in, in, in sincerity and truth through the law, through the law. He said, if anybody does that, he is proud. He knows nothing. But he's obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of truth, uh, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Look what he says at the end of verse 5. From such withdraw yourself. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Have you been in situations where, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're working with an individual, trying to talk them through, and you just see that boy, there is something that is off here. There is a different spirit that you're, you're trying to work and you're trying to see if, if you can come to terms on certain things and, and, and find common ground, but it always keeps coming back to this and this, and, and you just begin to realize this person is... I will, I will try to help this person, but as I continue to strive to work with this person, a fellow, fellow attendee or, or something, you begin, to, you begin to realize this, this person is, is over here. He has this kind of mindset. And, and as a result, it just comes right back around. It comes right back around. And at some point, we, we, we begin to realize this is not good. This is not good for me to even continue in this because it is, it, it will draw, it will pull me down. And I, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but how many of you have gone that extra step when you began to realize that and still uh, continued to, to try to help? It just don't get better. It doesn't get better. It gets worse and worse until we realize, oh yes, the, this, this, at some point, you know, you try to snatch a person out of the fire and pull them and help them, but if they refuse to do that and come back to these things that as we see and understand God's law, we can clearly see that this is not of God, and this person is not going that way. God expects us to judge righteous judgment. We're merciful, we're, but, but at the same time, we recognize this is not healthy. This is not spiritually to stay in this environment. I've got to withdraw myself. Uh, So, again, God's law and then followed up with the teachings of Paul, that gives us that clarity of how to deal with these situations uh, that that we see surrounding us. To the law and the testimony, as Isaiah 8 says, if they don't speak to that, then there is a problem, a major problem. Let's turn finally today to Deuteronomy 12. I think it's 
critical for us to, to stay, and it's not I think, it, it is critical for us to stay grounded in God's law because it helps us gain clarity on how to view things we're hearing from others. To not be duped. There's a lot of duping that is taking place right now. There's a lot of duping that's prophesied to occur. Satan's goals center on duping us and duping others. He is the, the duper of the world. I think, it's, I think technically it's deceiver of the whole world, but I like duper too. But he's the duper of the entire world. He is the, the, the master of deception. One of Satan's major techniques in false worship is in his attempt to dupe mankind by commandeering true worship with false worship. We can't get away from it. We try to put curtains up to block as much as we can, but we can't get away from it, can we? They're still around us. We see those, those symbols of, of an individual who has commandeered the things of God. Are we attuned to the things around us in society that Satan is attempting to commandeer? And are we on guard at all times? Do we detest it? Do we fear God and hate evil? I submit to you that we can only fear God and hate evil and, and not be duped to the degree which we are grounded in the law of God, this, the spiritual nature of the law of God that teaches us how to love him and fear him. As Mr. Horchak said uh, a while back in his message about God ex does God exist and how it ultimately comes to, to the point of where each of us needs to, as we, as we see that, to experience that on a level of relationship with God. We become convicted of God's existence through his calling, of course, but then our yielding to that and our forming a relationship with God. And like we said, like he said in Hebrews eleven six, he who believes that he is, uh, you know, wait, wait, as I said, faith is substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. How do we diligently seek him? We diligently seek him through observing his ways and, and drinking in of his word and drinking in of his laws. That's the diligently seek him. We become greater and great in a greater, greater way convicted of God, of who he is, and we begin to be able to see with greater clarity where the duping is going on and where the reality of truth in worshiping him in spirit and truth, where that is. We see Satan's attempts to commandeer. We see the commandeering of mistletoe. We see the commandeering of evergreen, a, a creation of God, beautiful trees that last through the winter and stay green. He is the, the, the false god of this world has commandeered that for, for his form of worship. Their branches, their, their wreaths, the sun, the S-U-N, this incredible creation of God that gives us light is, is to be worshipped. The moon is to be worshipped. Rabbits, uh, the, the lay eggs, pumpkins, pumpkins, uh, pumpkins are, are good. I, I love pumpkin pie. I love pumpkin bread. I love pumpkin bread with nuts and I love with little chocolate chips. They're delicious. But, but Satan commandeers that to, to, uh, to his worship with Halloween. Black cats. What's wrong with a black cat? Uh, we had a black cat. We liked our black cat. His name was Beep uh, back in Ohio. Bats, the giving of gifts. The, the gifts, the gift exchange, that's a wonderful thing. We give gifts at this time of year. Uh, Satan is commandeering that. Who is the perfect giver of gifts? <laughs> the eternal God. He is the great giver of gifts, of every gift that is of value, every good and perfect gift is, is from God the Father. Satan tries to commandeer that with that. Even Satan the devil attempts to commandeer love. Love. Think about that as we battle the, the things that we face in life and the pulls that we have. Satan is trying to commandeer what true love is to his purposes. God's people, as they stay grounded in the love of God through the word of God, through the law of God, love towards God and love towards man, understand who the real God of love is. It's Jesus Christ. We recognize that Satan has attempted to commandeer the rainbow, 
for his purposes. The rainbow, this, this incredible gift that God gives us in the sky to realize mankind that he will never, ever flood the earth again. And what is the rainbow used to demonstrate now? Satan, again, has taken that to something that is an abomination uh, in, in his eyes, in God's eyes. Let's turn finally to Deuteronomy 12, which you did and I didn't. Uh, Deuteronomy 12, verse 39, as, as we go forward and as we look at the things that are going on around us, as we stay grounded in God's law to what he says, we can, we can clearly uh, have an avenue to go. When the Lord your God cuts off from before you, verse 29, Deuteronomy 12, when the eternal your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess, and you displace them and dwell in their land, God has pulled us out of that. He is, he is taking us on a path towards his kingdom, and, and we are pulled out uh, from this world, citizens of his kingdom. Take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you. He, is, he has put away our sins, but we can become ensnared again, and that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, how did these nations serve their gods? I will do likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God that way. For every abomination to the eternal which he hates, they have done to their gods. And we're going to see that, we're seeing that, we're going to see that more and more. For they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. Verse 32, whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. Part three next time.